of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace yes. and peace to you from God. May God, God fill you with truth, truth and joy. joy. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you fulfilled the Easter promise by sending us your Holy Spirit. May that Spirit unite the races and nations on earth to proclaim your glory. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Meet the Most Reverend Mark D. Manning, Bishop of Dallas Universal Life Church in Dallas, Texas. More commonly, he's referred to as Bishop Mark. The cornerstone of his teaching stems from his alma mater at Jesuit Dallas, where the motto still stands today, Men for Others. This combined with the standoff approach to one's beliefs, stating to do that which is right, makes for an unorthodox, less controlling type of church, and a church that is dedicated to helping its congregants communicate through prayer, and a dialogue with God, while showing them ways to stay on their path. It's not about I, it's about others. Uh, it's about others, as, as are, are most things that have any importance in our lives. Because we strive to be men for others. Yes, idle minds are the playthings of the devil. That is why it is important for us to keep our focus on our destination and not be sidetracked. Moses intervened on behalf of the people and God had a change of heart. Centuries later, Jesus Christ would intercede on our behalf restoring our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. But as sure as I'm standing here today, I know that the path that he laid for you then is waiting for you now. All you have to do is open your eyes to see. Do that which is right. Yes, it's that simple. Dallas Universal Life Church officially came into being on May 31st, 2016. The first service was held on Christmas night, December 25th, 2016, and continued every Sunday afterwards. Don't get me wrong, it's wonderful that we're celebrating so early, but the problem is we're not celebrating the right things. But the path that God is leading us on is not the path of, I want, what did you get me? I want more. How do I get that? It's not about I. It's about others. Because we strive to be men for others. And I think that if we remember that, especially around Christmas, it's not about the giving. It's about the gifting. God gave us the Son, asking for nothing in return. In fact, gave us His Son to forgive our own sins of his love and his kindness and his unbelievable forgiveness of us and if you've ever given a gift and truly given it and not expected anything in return that feeling you get when that person's eyes light up you if you feel that sense of, not accomplishment, but sense of something, doing something right, giving without reason, well, without expectation, which is what all gifts should be. We give without expecting to receive something in return. On April 2nd, a milestone for the church was announced. I have one announcement to make before we move on. Kind of a big one. Uh, we had a very long way for this piece of mail right here. And, um, I'm very happy to say that the IRS has granted us our 501c3 status. So it's official, we're now a real church in the end of the guys of Doug. So yeah, please. On the surface, it would appear to most that Bishop Mark leads what would be considered a traditional style of service. But judge this book by its cover and friends are missing a large part of the story. Now that's what church is all about. We come together as brothers and sisters to celebrate what the Lord has done for us. We ought to tell how good God has been to us personally. We should witness that God is wonderful, that he has taken us from a state of nothingness and allowed us the privilege of making a significant contribution to the betterment of humankind. The church ought to be an area of joyous celebration every time the doors open. 
Bishop Mark's addition to his traditional service is what he calls the round table, which takes place after the standard dismissal. Those who wish can stick around and discuss the service, Christianity, or anything else that pertains to following that path that God has laid for them. Bishop Mark describes this session as a crucial part of the service, not only for the congregants who gain a better understanding of their faith and are able to often work through some difficult life lessons together, but also for himself because he gets the feedback he needs to know if he's leading them properly and teaching them how to follow that path and if they are getting it or not. So when I was there, hey, did anything you want to change? Anything you love about the service? Anything you want to en embellish or, or, or add to? Um, talk to me, what do you think? Nothing today, Gavin? Come on, you're always going to get a gift of dab over there. I love the gift of dab. I love Well, let's see. i got to say one thing that I do love the sermon. And I love the contrast of how we can choose between power and might versus the spiritual world, which is everlasting. And. Um, but what's everlasting in the spiritual world? What's the difference? I mean, everlasting just means it's a time, time frame. What is it? What's the difference between what's, we got spirit? We got the we got the might here, the, the power and the might here that, that on our earth, the earthly power. Earthly what's, power what do we power. have? What do we have in that other kingdom that's so different? Eternal power, eternal love, eternal grace. Um, there's just so much more. Like it's ridiculous because, quite frankly, one of the things that I absolutely love about the contrast is the fact that yeah, there's earthly might, yeah, there's earthly power, but all things fade in time. And this, especially on the earth, that's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the spiritual world, nothing fades. It's eternal, forever. And about the Almighty Father who created us. For, I believe he said it quite eloquently, from dust you were made, and to dust you shall return. Yeah, going right back to what? Ash Wednesday when we started like yes. that. The roots of Ash Wednesday go all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve and God's response to their disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Before banishing them from the Garden, God tells them what the consequences of their sin are. Because of your disobedience, you will work your whole life to provide food from the earth. And when your life is over, you will return to the ground from which you came. For you were made of dust, and to dust you shall return. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Those are the traditional words spoken to us on Ash Wednesday as we receive the mark of ash on our bodies. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Over the centuries, this day has stood as a deliberate reminder of our mortality, a reminder that we are not God, and that despite our best plans and efforts, all that we have and are will finally come to dust. God knows how we were made. God remembers that we are but dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers, <coughs> we bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone, as though we had never been here. Psalm 103. Bishop Mark's approach to leading his flock is often viewed on the surface as moderately traditional. But stay after the service for his roundtable discussion or go behind the scenes as he speaks openly and unscripted about his beliefs and the values his church upholds, and traditional wouldn't be a way to describe him or the theology of his church. Tim, what's bothering you? I've been talking to times. Yeah, you can. What is it? Well, I, I mean, first thing is I was thinking about my mother a lot. Okay. It's common. Tim, Tim lost his mother. Um, she passed away. How long, how long was it in that, Tim? Uh, um, in October of last year. Okay, so it's still pretty fresh. She, she loved Easter. Yeah, my mom did too. So, well, it's, I think it's hardest for a young man to lose his mother. And, and the opposite is it's hardest for a young woman to lose their mother right, or their father. It's just the way things work. And, I, and I believe me, I'm right there with you, man. I, I miss my mother very, very much. It's big. Thank you. But Easter's about new life. It's about resurrection. It's about re reborn, reborn, being reborn. And our faith tells us that she and with my mother and everybody else is in a much better place and hopefully watching over us. And yeah, I'll be all right. I know you'll be all right. Reading is good. She's smiling. 
Yeah, she'll show you something, especially these shorts for holiday. There'll be something that was special to her that you'll notice is out of the corner of your eye. And that will give you the biggest smile. See, my mother doesn't do that. My mother just throws things at me. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that story. I told you that story about her knocking everything off the wall, taking the nails out of the wall and everything. Yeah. <laughs> or about when I, on my birthday one year in this house, my first birthday here, she, I'm looking at my phone, it's like 12, 15, my birthday, it just become my birthday. I was sitting there by myself. And the phone goes black, and it says M O M on the phone. Wow. Scary. <laughs> My mother never did anything half-assed. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> she wanted to make sure I knew what she was saying. <laughs> so, but you'll think those moments would get you down, but they don't. They they lift you up. It scared the shit out of me at first. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> That's what it did. It scared. Yeah. It really did. It scared the bejesus out of me. But. I, mean, like, I actually threw the phone. I threw the phone across the room. But you know, after that, I realized, hey, you know, she's just trying to say, you know, she's probably been trying forever to. to Hello, Mark. Hey, I'm over here. Hey, and it didn't work. Right? Yeah. I'm so, you know, I'm not paying attention. So open your eyes, open your heart. Your mother's still here. She's still in your heart. She's still with you. Okay. All right. It's all good. Celebrate Easter as if she were here with you, because she is. Teaching what he calls the right way to pray is another of Bishop Mark's stress philosophies. With God, like most people don't pray, because when people pray today, they get on their knees and they pray, and they ask for their whatever they want, or they need uh, from God, and tell them, you know, what, what maybe maybe a little confession, telling them what we've done wrong, and then they get up and they walk away. And God was getting ready to say something back to them. The whole idea of prayer is it's a conversation. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a monologue. It's a conversation between you and God. And God will lead you on the right path. He, he laid that path for you when you were born. He's all, every one of us has a different one. I, as a pastor, can only guide you based on what God has shown me and what, what I've learned in my life. And... Um, for the good and the bad, I've, I've had my trials, I've had my tribulations, I've had the good and the bad, I've had the, the happiness and the sad, and they've all helped me to become the guide, if you will, that I am today, which is all that I look at myself as. I'm not a mentor, I'm not a, you know, a holy leader or somebody to follow necessarily, but I'm just a guide. I'm just here to help you stay on your path, wherever that may lead you. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God. May God be men for others. And I, I, I think that that is such an important thing to live. And if we do that every day, just remember that you're not living this for yourself. Do something for others. Don't do it for yourself. It will all come back to you. It will be provided to you. Give to others and it will come back. Mm -hmm. You will have no need to have to worry about things. And it's hard to, to, to put that faith in, in God and in in, in in that particular statement of if I do for others, I will also receive them. It works though. Do for others and you will get in return. That's a huge thing for me. That's, that's, a, that's a base, that's a, a cornerstone of our, of our church, if you will. By continually choosing to be men and women for others, every second of every day of our lives, we can then begin to understand what unconditional love really is. You see, it's not about the accolades or the prestige or the fame. It's about leading through example with a life that we can be proud of. Unselfish, non-judging, humble, honest. I, religion has gotten such a bad name, you know, uh, because humanity's involved in it. You're going to have corruption. You're going to have... Um, mistakes. You have all sorts of things that that can happen with, with, with imperfect humans. And God knows that. But sometimes I think we don't. And we look at this book that's been created with human hands, although in God divinely inspired, still created with human hands. And we sometimes take it a little too far. I think we have to remember that, yes, God breathed life into this book. But there's a lot's gone through a lot of pain since then. And although I believe fantastic learning lessons of life, fantastic ways to stay on your path to your God, fantastic ways to learn from others, 
mistakes in the past, you also take it with a grain of salt. And you have to learn that interpretations are wrong at times. And that pages are missing. And I think if you just learn to, like I said in the beginning, pray the right way, the book becomes a study guide where you can talk to God face to face, right from the man, telephone to telephone, ear to ear. And you don't need a book. All you have to do is listen. Mm-hmm. If people would just shut up and listen, Sometimes. just shut up and listen, mm-hmm. the world would be so much better. And here I go talking and talking and talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Please rise. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. So say what you have to say, then shut up and listen. When's the last time you actually prayed? And before you got off your knees, you closed your mouth, cleared your mind, and listened to what he said back. How many people learned how to pray this Lent? How many people learned how to sit and pray? Is anybody doing that like we talked about? Is anybody practicing that? Mm-hmm. I'll let that will be done. And, yeah. what, else, what else though we talked about, Gavin? What else we talked about about how, how to pray? There's something very, very important that we all don't do. We all listen. mess it up. We listen for response. You listen. You know, we all sit there and, hey, God, I need this, 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 and I need this, 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 and feel this, and feel that, and do this, and do better, and give me all the money in the world, and then you get up and walk away. And God's standing there with his mouth open because he's about to say something to you, but you turned your back on him and walked out the door. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. Yes, you're hearing voices. You're supposed to listen to them. He's going to help you stay on your path. If you're schizophrenic, go get some medicine. (laughs) You know his voice when you hear it. It's different for all of us. It doesn't, it's not really a sound. It's a a breath, it's a feeling. heartbeat, I feel like it's a feeling, it's a fleeting moment. <coughs> prayer is not a conversation, or prayer is not a, a monologue. Yes. Prayer is not a monologue. In other words, when you get down on your knees and you pray, and you say what you want to say, and you ask for whatever you want to ask for, when you get up and walk away, you didn't just pray. All you do is talk. Mm-hmm. Okay? Prayer is a conversation between you and God. And if you're done talking to him, don't get up and walk away because I think it's kind of rude. You need to listen because he's ready to talk back. So you clear your mind and shut your mouth and listen. Believe me, if you listen, you will not only hear him, you will feel him. It's not the voices in your head this time. It's it's God speaking to you. And that is the fundamental teaching that I think that so many of us miss is that how to pray. How do you pray? If Jesus came to you, I was going to say, could it be your, your, your inner voice? That, 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 that's right. the way that God... That inner voice, that, 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 that thing I'm always talking about, about praying, and uh, most people don't pray. They don't. They just don't do it. They're talking. You know, and how many times do I have to say it? Prayer is a conversation, not a monologue. That's correct. Prayer is not a monologue. It's a conversation between you and God. And if you just get down on your knees and you say, I want this, that, and the other, and please give me this, please give me that, and pray and bless this person and mighty die, and then get up and walk away, what have you done? You just left God standing there. With his, he's just he's getting ready to talk to you and say something, and you just walked away. So you missed the whole point. You ask him for these things, and he's going to tell you how to get them, how to get the things that you need in your life, not necessarily that you want, but you need. Right? Um, we, we believe that all are welcome. All are welcome to communion. Jesus Christ didn't put stipulations on that. As always, we celebrate communion in the way of Jesus Christ. All are welcome to share in this celebration. 
No one is excluded. We humbly thank our Lord Jesus Christ for this gift that we share today and pray for and strengthen our bonds as Christian men, as men and women, for others. Amen. Bishop Mark is adamant in offering communion to anyone and everyone who wants it. Church member or not, Christian or not, reminding everyone at services that this is the way that Christ offered communion, without stipulations or requirements. Unlike the beliefs of his Roman Catholic roots, Bishop Mark and his congregation don't believe the bread and wine are actually the body and blood of Christ, but are a holy symbol or representation that we remember the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. Something I've always seen in church, and I kind of think it's something's missing. And that's me, here's the elder to talk to me. Because I talked at you, and hopefully helped you catch a little something, but the last hour or so, so now it's your turn to give me a little feedback. And it helps me because we are a new church, as you can tell. We just started our first service was Christmas of last year. So we've had our ups and downs and our ins and outs, and, and uh, there's been days that I've done the service by myself, but it still gets done. It's always happens here on Sunday. Um, so what I always ask is, what do you got for me? What do you think? What did you like? What did you not like? What would you include? What would you keep, take out? Um, is there anything that you thought was particularly wonderful that moved you? Is there anything that you just, just absolutely hated that you want me to get rid of? So think about it for a second. Feel free to speak to me. This is completely candid and open. You're not going to hurt my feelings. This is all about trying to make things better. I was awestruck and breast it took my breath away and I think you should probably get a box of Kleenex because I actually got tears came to my eyes and that's when I used the restroom and got tissue. So what part what part what part brought the tears to your eyes? Before you came out, mm -hmm. just the setting and mm -hmm. the the smell of the room and Memories? Well, not really memories. This is a new New thing for you, huh? This is new I mean it was just like official, you know, it was mm -hmm. like Good. It's officially in my home, it is, um, but you know, it is what we have right now. Um, we, we were just granted our 501c3 status last week, which has been a battle. I'll tell you that they don't make it easy for churches to exist and to get that, that certification. So in, in, the, in the eyes of uh, the United States government, we are a church. Um, so until that happened, we couldn't even begin to look for a place to, to have uh, our own building or, or a place of worship. So. This was the best we could do, and, and, and it, it is what it is, and I, I'm, I'm glad to open my home up, and I'm, I hope that we can fill it up, and it's the standing room only. I mean, I love the fact that y'all are all here. I think it's it's, it's a huge boost for me. Um, but it is still my home, and it is, I try to make it as official as possible in here. I try to make it feel as comfortable and more like a, a church setting, but these, these, these couches move right back into place, and we have a, a nice little living room in a little while, so. But I, I want something that's a little more permanent, and we're working towards that, and hopefully, um, uh, soon we will find something. Raw, gritty, graphic, and no holes barred conversations with the congregation are standard practice here. Bishop Mark doesn't mince his words and is known to often be brutally honest as to avoid any confusion in what his intended message is. Bishop Mark is not one to sugarcoat anything, citing that it is a waste of time. All right, let's talk about this. What did you like? What did you not like? What do you want to keep? What do you want to get rid of? What did you get out of the sermon day? Let's talk about anything you want to talk about about today, about a sermon, about a service, and, and go from there. Let's uh, just tell me what you think. Well, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, I can sit here and, and BS you all day long, right? I can talk, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and not do anything. I mean, I can say whatever I want to say. I can be, you know, I mean, it's about doing. It's about action. It's about putting your money where your mouth is, if, you, if, if, if that's what you're saying. I mean, it's always about money, but that's just a yeah. way of saying it. And you got to put your energy into it, not just into your words. Your words are great, but um, if, if your words don't have anything to back them up, they're really nothing. Sure. I mean, you're nothing more than your word. I mean, your word is is, is you. I mean, that's, if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Yeah. And if you're not going to, if you're not, if you get that reputation of being the one who says he does it and never does, well, that, that pretty much sucks. And that's not what you want to be. Yeah. Because you talk about choosing your path. Yes, we choose our paths. We choose. Do we choose the one that God laid out for us? God designed exclusively for each of us? Usually, we do, I think, for the most part. I think a lot of times we do stray from that, though. And it's very easy to get off that path and lose sight of where we're going. Got to keep that sight on that final goal, which is what? 
What's that final goal that we're talking about? Where's that goal taking us to? Heaven. Heaven. Yeah. Everlasting life. Promise of. Promise of eternal life. Of love. God's eternal place. love. Nothing but. Yeah. When, we, when we use our own will instead of God's will, we get in trouble. God gave us free will. He gave that gift to us. But when we choose to ignore His word, His desires for us, we end up missing the path. We end up on the side, or skewed, or even going backwards, right? Now we have a Bishop Mark's approach to leadership is more down to earth, less up in the clouds, and less pretentious, and is found with mainstream pastors. Last Supper, and we do feet washing. Feet washing? Feet washing. Yeah, stay absolutely. away from mine. You might get knocked over. Just have clean feet when you come. <laughs> yeah. Please, please, make sure your feet are cleaned somewhat properly before you get here. I know that it's feet washing, but it's not feet cleansing. We're not, we're not doing pedicures and men and all that. It's just a simple wash. It's, it's, it's a symbol here. Yes. Don't make me get the Lysol out, please. <laughs> uh, so Friday, sure to get the pedicures. Course, Friday is I, what I consider the holiest day of the year. It's the most somber Christian day of the year. It is also, I think, the best and most righteous day of the year. It's, it's the day that Jesus Christ was tried and died for our sins. And, um, our service will be, hopefully, if I can get this thing right, I'm really hoping that that's, that's the service. I, I really like doing Good Friday service. I know it sounds almost morbid, but it's amazing to, to sit there and, and, and reenact parts of it where you scream, crucify him. Because we do that every day without saying the words. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big one for me. I hope you all, all can make it on Friday. Sunday's so Easter and it's a wonderful day and we're going to have a wonderful pot and we're going to relax a little bit after that and I'm going to go on vacation. So, anything else you want to hit me with guys before I go? Okay, hang around, have some fellowship. You know, we call this Holy Week um, and most people call this Holy Week, Holy Week. and it is, it's a, it's a most solemn, solemn week of the church here. But kind of in, in humor, a lot of the, the preachers and, and pastors and priests in the world call it Hell Week. Because it is, <laughs> it's it's a lot of work. Um, for me personally, I did uh, we did four four services in, in one week. So we had last Sunday, we had Palm Sunday, and then we had Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then today. And we also have our own lives besides that. So um, you know, it's, it was kind of like doing a month's worth of service in one week, and it was you know four four programs, four preparations, four music preparations, four communions and then you added some foot feet washing and some, some people dying and people being put in a tomb and it's just craziness I tell you it's, it's nuts but it's all worth it and um his congregation seems to thrive on his often in your face honest and interactive approach to teaching yeah. all right one of the things that I really like is personally the fact that I'm actually part of a new and upcoming church mm -hmm. I think that's a real blessing because the fact that I actually get to see it just starting from the ground up, which is really, really cool. And I think you've made wonderful progress as far as um, the sermons and everything like that. You've done a magnificent job on preparation. Thank you. And I know that wasn't easy, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> but while it's hurting. But um, I think it's a wonderful thing that we're all here and a lot more people turned out than I originally thought was going to turn out, so that's really, really cool, and I'm very grateful for that, and for those of you who are new, I would like to welcome you to our church, and say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Gavin. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Gavin's, our, Gavin's been named our usher, so he's our official usher, so that's his position. <laughs> I think he does a great job, at. he's got yeah, the gift of Gavin, for sure, so he can definitely <laughs> get the people in the, in, in the seats. And are you saying I talk a lot? Just My a little. God. No. It's all a good thing. It's all a good thing. All right. <laughs> Uh, I, last Friday, my my favorite, and it's going to sound almost more, my favorite day of the church year is Good Friday. Um, and because it's just I, the, the entire sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us uh, comes to light. And I, I we had a group that was here last Friday, and it was kind of our, our normal core group, some of our young, young guys that have helped us start this church. And I don't think it really hit home what what that day meant until we got toward the end of our service and and spoke basically in lay terms. We weren't just reading from the Bible and we just kind of said, look, this is this is a man and he's going to die and he's going to be beaten and he's going to hurt and he's going to suffer. All of that for each and every one of us in this room. And 
it's still, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it um, because I, I think it, it took me really living my life, I and mean, I've gone to church all my life and done services all my life and never felt <laughs> that, never understood that. And there comes a point in your life where you go, he was just like me, you know, but he was chosen to to die for us and to suffer. And thank God, rose rose from the dead on the third day. And today we celebrate that Easter Sunday. Though the bishop is clear that all are welcome to join his church and be baptized and celebrate communion, his church, of course, is still deeply rooted and anchored in the Christian faith, and many common Christian traditions remain in his services. The bishop tells his followers and potential congregants to come, listen, take what you can use from it with you, and leave the rest, stressing that it's the message and the lesson that is truly important, not necessarily who the story is about or who teaches it. Bishop Mark believes and teaches that all paths lead to God, which are in direct opposition to most of the Christian churches of today, and can cause some friction and controversy. I now bestow upon you Ronnie Dwayne Edwards, a certificate commemorating this day, March the 28th, 2017, the day of your baptism. Well, that's it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Are you supposed to clap or no? You clap. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Welcome. Congratulations. Their resurrection faith was dawning. It seems incredible that followers of Jesus did not expect him to come out of the tomb alive. After all, he had told them many times that he would be raised from the dead. Early in his ministry, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. After his resurrection, the disciples remembered that he had said this. And his enemies remembered it too. Anything about the service, about the scripture today, anything about Jesus Christ rising from the dead. I mean, this is a crazy notion. This is man. What do you think about this? You go to this guy's funeral, if you will. You put him in a tomb. You roll the tomb closed. I'm sure many of you have been to funerals. That's pretty much it. You know, you walk away, and then you have a place to go and visit and put flowers, you know, whenever you want to go see them or remember them. But this time, you have this people going to this tomb, and there's no body there. The body is gone. It's rather morbid. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about his body been sitting in this tomb for three days. The stench alone would, would probably knock you out. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, it's, I mean, it's the, the human nature. I mean, and I mean, I would be scared to death at that point, seeing this this body's gone, and people are saying he rose from the dead. Was he a ghost? Is he a zombie? What the hell is it? You know. <laughs> um, so, does anybody have any 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 insight on that? How do you feel about? The fact that there's this, that Jesus Christ just rose from the dead. He's uh, walking around with wounds in his hands and in his side, and he's walking and breathing and talking to us. But then it's very vague as to what he means by it, right? Mm -hmm. He says, the only way to God is through me. Really? And we discussed this last week. We said, we said Scott over here is not Christian. He's, he's a Buddhist, right? So, because God, because Jesus Christ says the only way through God, to God is through Him, does that mean God's going to hell? And what did we all come up with last week? Yeah. Okay, why did we come up with that? Because basically what we originally said was that I believe, considering how much good Scott does and everything like that, that all paths lead to God. Important, that's the phrase I'm looking for. All paths lead to God. We can be living, those people can be living Christ-like lives. I believe Scott lives a Christ-like life uh, for the most part. I mean, I think we all lead in our way a Christ-like life. And we all, we're all sinners as well. I was about to say. But, <laughs> no, 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 don't get me wrong. We're all sinners. Uh -huh. And that's, that's a given. But I think for the most part, we all lead good Christ-like lives, even though we may not call it that, we may call, we may not ever say that we are Christ-like or that Christ is our Savior. Or, but I think that that what, what the sermon was trying to say today was the fact that you don't have to necessarily say the words because God is not going to exclude. <coughs> God is not going to discriminate against you. Did you lead a good life? Did you do as maybe Christ would have done? Did you lead a life that you knew what right from wrong? Because we all know right from wrong. I think that's inherent. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? 
Well, yeah, but because you didn't say the words, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Because you didn't say those words, you're going to hell. Does that sound like what, what your God, what my God, what our, the God we speak of every Sunday would, would do? I don't think so. Bishop Mark is not one to back down from a good confrontational debate and will not hold back as to be politically correct or to avoid rocking the boat. Even dealing with some of Christianity's long-standing core teachings, Bishop Mark doesn't hold back. Teaching is all-inclusive, all paths lead to God, theology, negating the need to be saved by stating that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Traditional Christians obviously find this a sensitive issue, and few buy into his modern views of an unconditionally loving, all-inclusive God, preferring to stick with their archaic belief that God excludes non-Christians from his kingdom, even if they have lived a good, honest, and honorable life. A college student once told me, my parents are good people, but because they aren't Christians, if they were to die tomorrow, they would go to hell, along with other good people like Buddha, and the Dalai Lama. Now the problem in today's reading emerges in John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How often have people been brutalized by the message? <coughs> Historically, and especially in recent times, this passage has been used as both a carrot and a stick. It charts out a way to salvation. From this perspective, doubters, seekers, and faithful adherents of other faith traditions are ultimately doomed unless they explicitly accept Jesus as Savior. Anyone who stands outside these requirements is destined to damnation. This passage becomes the antithesis to the greater things God imagines for it when we interpret it individualistically, exclusively, and literally. Imagination is stunted and the gifts of the Spirit wither on the vine. Moreover, this passage can be theologically destructive if taken out of the context of John's Gospel and a holistic understanding of Jesus' life and message. Jesus' ministry was grounded in relationship rather than creed or theological litmus test. Follow the way of Jesus brings joy and salvation. Jesus' way, however, is not a demand, but a graceful invitation. Jesus barred no one from the path of salvation. Jesus is the way to salvation in an inclusive way. All paths of salvation and enlightenment are grounded in the graceful energy of God. We walk the pathway to many mansions in many diverse ways, lured by God's moment-to-moment -moment inspiration. We can, we can still speak of Jesus as supreme without denigrating other faiths and casting doubt on people's eternal destinies. We can understand Jesus' pathways and embracing grace that animates and empowers all authentic paths. We can be confessional pluralists, recognizing that the diversity of spiritual paths is not a fall from grace, but a reflection of God's personal relationship with every culture and person. Christ is the way that includes all authentic ways, enabling all ways to be fruitful. When we interpret John 14, 6 imaginatively and inclusively, then it becomes our fourth promise. <coughs> God guides us on the pathway wherever we are on our journey. God's energy enlightens all persons in all cultures makes a way where there is no way, and leads all creation and all of its diversity to wholeness. The bishop thinks that his point on this topic is so important that he deviates from the scripted service, something rarely done, and jumps into an impromptu roundtable discussion, immediately following a sermon. Anybody catch any of that? Mm -hmm. Good. Catch any of that? Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I was listening to that. It spoke about how God's diversity is essentially as hard as it may be, like the whole idea of if Buddha, if the Dalai Lama doesn't isn't a Christianity, they're going to hell, and this actually becomes one of the one of the I guess the theses or whatever the the whole idea of people having any problems with it. 
So what is it? What is it saying though about that? It's saying that God is basically diverse, and that no matter what, I think personally in my belief that I think it's saying that if you're good and you're honest and you're true, then yes, you're going to go to heaven. What did, what did I just say? In the, what did I say about that? What do you, how did we come across with that? I mean, basically, you're saying the same thing I said. But what did I say? I said. That God is the, the the paths, all paths lead to God. Yes. So by saying God, that Jesus Christ never ever discriminated against people and said, "Look, you can't come. Yeah, you know, you're not allowed to." He did say, "Through me," but you have to read it creatively, if you will. Like it says, you've got to be. You to understand that God is an all-inclusive God, and I think it's ridiculous for that, that for us to possibly think that God would take people who are genuinely good people and and damn them to hell based on the fact that they don't say the words when in fact they followed the way of Christ to begin with just because they said they didn't say they did just because they didn't say the words they were leading Christ like lives right exactly I think that's right. an important thing this is what we talked about last week in our in our session after service it's that's, that's why it's so I really wanted to get this across to because I don't think y'all got it last week. What we were trying to get, what we we're trying to say, it's very important to understand. We don't take we, the, the Christianity is not discriminatory. Christianity does not judge. It's not our place to look at the Buddhists and the Jews and 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 and, the, and Islam and 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 say, look, you're sinners. You don't believe in Jesus. You don't say Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Therefore, you're going to hell. First of all, that's not our place to say that, mm -hmm. even though many Christians feel that it is. Uh, God is the only one to make that decision. But we are to accept these people and teach them if they don't know, if they're not living it, how to walk with Christ, how to walk like Christ. And sometimes you don't even have to say the words, you just have to walk the walk, right? Okay. Actions speak louder than words. Absolutely, and that's part of our, uh, our church's uh, saying, isn't it? Non diligamus verbo nec lingua sed in opere et veritate. Right? If you, don't know I, if you don't know what I said, go look at the church website because it says it on there what it is. You should know that. Okay? Here. Mark? You may be a priest, but tell me what it says because you know better. It, it, I'll tell you what it says in a nutshell. It says basically, actions speak louder than words. That's what it says. It says basically, walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. Your talk is nothing. You got to walk the walk. Show me. If Jesus came back today and did these things that he did back in 2,000 years ago and claimed to be the Son of God and perform these miracles on the street, what would we do? And anyone to deny him. Hmm? <laughs> Most people would find anyone to deny him. Mm -hmm. Anything that where's the where's the strings? Where's the rope? Where's the hidden cameras? This was just on you know, just you know, is this a television show? Is this the Carbonaro effect? You know, is this some TV show you're trying to 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 scoot to teach a, to catch us on, you know? Or this man's blasphemous. He's crazy. Put it in Parkland. <laughs> <laughs> right? Think about it. We would do the same thing today we did to them then. To, did to him then. The exact same thing. I can't imagine that I wouldn't. I mean, I would think the same things. This man, Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So am I. And so am I. And so are you. All in all, the Most Reverend Marky Manning wants nothing more than for his congregation to grow in love and to be better people, following not necessarily the interpreted Word of God, but the actual words that God speaks to each of his followers through the simple act of prayer. He wants his congregation to live a more selfless life, as men and women for others, believing that God will ultimately provide. He is down to earth, honest, and unfiltered and has been known to ruffle a few feathers, especially those of the religious right. He genuinely wants people to meet and understand his God, an all-inclusive, all-loving, and all-powerful God who governs fairly, and is approachable rather than the lofty, distant God of his youth. I think now that we move past Lent and the introspective time of 
of thinking about ourselves and really working on our own sins and working on ourselves to grow. During this next week, we need to go outward. Let's bloom a little bit. Let's bloom like the Easter lilies, Easter lilies did, not Easter lilies, Easter lilies. And try and exude our ability to be men and women for others. Let's try and be this week more observant of the needs of others um, and give what we can to them in whatever way we can. I don't mean you have to give money or anything else. Just sometimes you're walking down the street and someone just sees a hello or a hey. Hey, what's up? That can change the life of a person uh, who who knows what those people are thinking at that point. They may have been having the most horrible day of their lives and you just save them from jumping off that bridge. I know that sounds extraordinary, but it has happened. And at those times is when Jesus Christ works through us and we don't even necessarily know it. But by continuing to do the acts of uh, working, being, being there for others, being men and women for others, we have to consider a cornerstone of this church, being men and women for others. We then open ourselves up to be done for. God will provide for us. God always has and always will. And by giving of ourselves and of our means and of our abilities and of our whatever we have to give, whatever He's given us, our gift to give, then we are open ourselves up to receive what we need to receive. Not what we, know we want to receive and what we need to receive are two different things. Sometimes the same, but very often very, very different. So, during the next week, let's concentrate on being men and women for others. The Most Reverend Mark D. Manning, Bishop, Dallas Universal Life Church. Bishop, Pastor, Reverend, Friend. Controversial, imperfect, honest, caring but stern, generous to a fault, stubborn, filled with emotion, spiritual, a man of God, a man for others. If you have found freedom, take it with you in the world. If you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love and unity, give some back to a bruised and hurting world in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve God.
think of it. And bring somebody to church next Sunday. It's Dallas County. Please bring somebody to church. Get out. Get out, get out, get out. You're fine. Yeah.